morning, Sampat Kanan, University of Pennsylvania. Okay, so I heard more than one person say to me that uh, this talk sounds interesting, but I don't understand the abstract at all. <laughs> so uh, hopefully I will explain it. Uh, I'll explain what this title means by the end of the talk. You will know what it is. But you have to be a little bit patient. This is kind of like an anthology of short stories, where sometimes the title of the whole anthology is one of the stories. And uh, so this is the second story. But uh, the first story is not that dissimilar. Okay, so we'll see what that is. Uh, so real-time decision making, that's the, that's the title of the workshop. Uh, most of the talks we've heard are decision making by algorithms. So this talk is not about decision making by algorithms, but decision making about algorithms. And I'll explain what that means. There are two versions, two theoretical models I'll present about decision making about algorithms. I think these are pretty decent models, but uh, they're a little bit, uh, they're good theoretical framework, but they're a little bit hollow because there are not that many great examples yet. So that's uh, a perfect time to, to think about these models and do some good work. So there's a lot to be done here. Um, okay, so let me start with the first, okay, I should do it this way. Um, so many of you have encountered this kind of setting where you're driving on a highway, maybe you're a passenger in a car, and you, you're planning to take 55 northbound to Mallory, 3rd Street, and here you see this sign. Okay, maybe the highway department needs to invent more signs to help you in these situations. Maybe they need to say you know, something like uncertainty just ahead or tough decisions ahead. But, uh, but the situation you're in is that you're, you're in the passenger seat. You know that this exit is supposed to come in a certain amount of time. You've got to decide what to do, uh, how to find. You don't know this area very well. You've got to decide what, how to find the alternative. And uh, you, you have a few heuristics you can think of. One is to pull out your smartphone and try to plan out a new route. But re that requires you to enter some very complicated input that says, avoid this exit and find me some other route. And you don't quite know how to do that. It might take you a little while. The other is to turn on your radio and stick to a favorite AM station and wait for the traffic report to cycle in. The third thing is to scan your radio dial and try to find a station that's showing traffic at the moment. So there's a three different heuristics you could use, and you don't know which one to use. Okay, so um, so this is one example of a situation. Change your destination. Sorry, change your destination. <laughs> that's not an option. Sorry. Um, okay, so. So the first part of the talk tries to model the situation in one, or consider the situation in one theoretical way. And this is talk on, um, this is a part called timers. So I'll explain what they are. Um, so, so it's basically, if you want to turn a heuristic into a good algorithm, what's the difference between a heuristic and an algorithm? We all know that in our field very well. Uh, so typically when you have a heuristic to make it an algorithm, you want to prove correctness and you want to prove time bounds. Um, and so what if we cannot do that, which happens a lot? Um, we can try to do empirical demonstrations that the heuristic works well. This is not a preferred mode in our field somehow, but uh, I think it's worth trying some cases. The other sort of fashionable thing to do is to make the heuristic modify itself and call it machine learning. But I'm not <laughs> going to talk about that. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, so the other, the, 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 the point of the timers uh, section is to try to establish, establish these properties on the fly. You don't prove something in the worst case about the heuristic, but try to establish either correctness or uh, in this case time bounds on the fly as you get the input. So sort of the, specific to the actual Specific input. to the actual input. So that's the real time aspect of the, the The thing that's happening in real time is that the input is arriving. You have a, heuris, a few heuristics in mind, maybe or one, let's say, and uh, you have to decide how will this heuristic perform on this input. Okay. So uh, in, the, in the example that I gave of the driving scenario, the passenger is the heuristic, in a way. Or the passenger using the phone is a heuristic, or the passenger using the radio dial is a heuristic. And, uh, and the input that's arriving is this information you're getting on the freeway that says this exit is closed or whatever. That's the input that arrives. And you have to decide if you as a heuristic can handle this input fast, or which of your heuristics can handle the input fast. Okay, so what is the... Um, um, so for, pro program, for correctness, there's a well-established um, sort of formalism called program checkers. And uh, here's how that works. So I'm going to sort of 
try to draw inspiration from this, so I'll just briefly explain how checkers work. Um, so you have a heuristic. It takes an input i and produces an output o. You have a notion of what it means for the heuristic to function correctly. That's independent of the heuristic itself. And uh, what a checker does, uh, this heuristic is supposed to compute some function f. So this is a checker that checks if the heuristic is computing f. Uh, it, it also looks at the input and looks at the output produced by the heuristic. It is allowed to talk to the heuristic, uh, ask the heuristic other questions about other inputs. And uh, uh, it's supposed to have these following properties. If the heuristic is buggy on this particular input, then we want the checker, which is randomized, to output buggy with very high probability. If the heuristic is correct on all inputs, then we want the checker to say, yes, it's correct with high probability. You don't want to say uh, raise a false alarm. But there's a gap here, meaning if the heuristic is buggy on some other input, the checker may or may not detect that bug right now. It's, it's only required to requ detect the bug that's happening right now, if it is happening. And uh, if not, it's free to say whatever it wants. And roughly speaking, we want the checker to be more efficient than the heuristic, because if not, what's the point of running the checker? We might as well run a correct program in the first place. The checker has to be fast. OK, so how do we translate this into the timing world? So try to come up with a similar idea for run, running time. Um, so you have a heuristic that says it's known to be correct. Let's say that we're not worrying about the correctness problem, only about the timing problem. Um, so th of x is the notation I'm going to use for the time taken by heuristic h on, on input x. Okay, th of x. You're given a deadline function. That, that is the amount of time you want to allow the heuristic to run on inputs of length n. So d of n is the amount of time the heuristic has to run on inputs of length n. Um, and we say that E is a timer for a heuristic with a deadline function. And this was the original definition, uh, that if on any input x, if, if, the, if the timer says stop, that means the heuristic is going to take more than the deadline amount of time. So this is kind of a timer going maybe in the opposite direction to what you want, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So if the heuristic is going to take a long time, this timer will tell it to stop sometimes, not always. Um, the definition is very loose. Um, and, and then, oops, what happened? See? Uh, so, and the other thing is that we, we want, um, so that means, okay, sorry, what this means is that if a heuristic is going to run fast on some input, the timer will never stop the heuristic on that input. So it'll only stop the heuristic on some inputs where the, the heuristic does take a long time. Um, and we want the, the timer to be useful in some sense. And what does it mean to be useful? We want to say that if there's any input, that causes the heuristic to take more than the deadline amount of time, then uh, there's some input at least on which the timer says stop. I mean, you can imagine a timer that just never says stop, right? And that's uh, fairly useless. And this is forcing the timer to say stop, at least on some input where the heuristic takes a long time. Uh, and the last thing we, might, we will want is that the, the timer itself runs in time less than the deadline function. OK, and I'll explain why. In a, I mean, it's obvious, but I'll say why in a minute. Are there any questions on the definition? So again, it's a sort of the soundness in a sense for here is that the heuristic, if it takes less than the deadline time, then you let it run for sure. And then the, the liveness or the usefulness, or maybe something like that, is that if it takes long, then you will stop it at least some of the time. And, uh, and then it runs fast. Um, OK. so. Timers, in some cases, are very easy to de define. Sometimes there's a hidden parameter of the input that determines how long the algorithm takes. If you can quickly evaluate this parameter and then compute how long it would take, and it's less than the deadline, you can let it run in those cases. Or if it takes more than that deadline, then you can stop it. That's one way to design timers. Um, if we can somehow prove, and this is, these are trivial cases, if, if you can somehow prove that the heuristic does work within time d of n, you can say always go because then uh, that's clearly correct. Um, and of course, the reason we ask the timer shouldn't take more than d of n time is that if you allow it to take d of n time, you can just simulate h for d of n time. And then if it stops, you stop. And if it doesn't stop, you just say stop at that point anyway. Right, so, um, so those are some simple examples. Um, 
Okay, so there are many variants of timers. I'll give some examples in a minute, but there are many variants of timers. Um, so you can have a strong timer, which should say, whenever the, so whenever the heuristic will finish within the deadline, it should say go. But whenever, for at least a constant fraction of the inputs on which the heuristic will take more than the deadline, it should say stop. Not just one input, but for a constant fraction, if you can. That's a strong timer. Uh, and then a complete timer is somehow able to exactly get a sense of how long the, the t heuristic will take. And it says, you know, uh, it, it says stop if and only if the heuristic will take more than the deadline time. It's very hard to imagine designing complete timers. Uh, and it's very easy by diagonalization standard techniques to construct heuristics for which there are no timers. Forget complete timers, even just timers. Uh, so that's, so in general, the problem is undecidable. So the game here is to say, can we design timers for particular heuristics that we have? Okay. Um, and, and, and heuristics can be randomized too, so there are probabilistic timers as well. Um, so there's a probability that you say stop and go and those all do the right things. Um, and the last, last kind of variant that's maybe interesting is to have a gap between, so you want the, the heuristic, the timer to say go whenever the heuristic takes less than the deadline time and you want it to say stop whenever it takes a, f a factor uh, more than the deadline time. So there's a gap between the deadline for go and a deadline uh, and a point at which you should say stop. Okay, so there's, there's other variants like that. Um, okay, so let me give you one or two small examples. Um, so one example, say bubble sort, uh, everyone's favorite sorting algorithm. Um, so let's say that you're given a deadline function that is some constant times n squared, say n squared over 100 or something like that. And you want to know if bubble sort would, is going to take, uh, so you want to, you're given an input array and you want to run bubble sort if it's going to stop within n squared over 100 and stop it if it's going to take more than some n squared times some other constant something. Um, so we know that uh, bubble sort is well understood. We know that uh, the number of exchanges performed by bubble sort is proportional to the number of inversions in the array. So a very trivial timer here is to ra pick random elements, back random pairs of elements, and see if they represent an inversion. So an inversion, by the way, is two indices i and j such that xi is greater than xj. Uh, so they're in opposite order of what they should be. So you pick random pairs of indices and if they are an inversion, you count the fraction of times you get an inversion and you get an estimate of the expected number of inversions. And therefore you can know if bubble sort is going to take a really long time or above the deadline or not and, and, then, and then stop it if you have to. You can actually make this, this is an order one randomized timer. You, and it's complete, you can, you can show that up to a certain factor, it'll catch all the, all the things that'll take more than some amount of time and, and will let run all the things that'll take less than a certain amount of time. Uh, but you can also get an order n deterministic timer by doing something a little bit cleverer, a little bit more complicated. Um, Knuth gives a very detailed analysis of um, bubble sort and the inversions and how you can estimate the inversions in various ways. And if you use one of those formulas, it turns out that you can get an order n timer uh, deterministically for this as well. Um, so I won't go into that. Okay, so generalizing this idea, there's a nice relationship which is not, full, not very much explored at all between um, sort of timer design and property testing and spot checking. Um, so, so what is property testing? Uh, for those of you who haven't heard this, property testing is a really neat sublinear procedure which takes some kind of combinatorial object and the goal is to determine whether that, ob say, uh, let me give you a concrete example. Um, so you're given a graph and the property you're interested in is, is the graph bipartite, let's say. Uh, so this property can be tested, which means, what, what that means is that you can take some constant time, there's a constant time procedure, which if the graph is truly bipartite, will say yes, this is bipartite uh, with, uh, with certainty. And if the graph is far from being bipartite, and by far we mean that uh, uh, epsilon n squared edges have to be removed before the graph can be made bipartite. Uh, so a good number of edges have to be removed before the graph can be made bipartite. Then this procedure will say not bipartite as well. So this is property testing an example. So as a general general um, sort of paradigm, which uh, allows you to test certain properties by saying is this is this object have this property, or is it far from having this property? And there is a version of property testers called 
tolerant property testers, this tolerant property tolerant testers, where you want to pass the objects that maybe not don't have the property, but they're within a certain distance of within a small distance of having the property, epsilon one, and reject the objects which are very far from having the property, epsilon two. So you have this notion of property testing, um, and we can there are many properties that you can tolerantly test in um, basically constant time. Uh, and so the, the idea would be, if you could define a property that is captured by exactly those inputs for which a heuristic is fast, then a property testing framework would allow you to design a timer for, uh, for those heuristics. And many sorting algorithms have this. I mean, so basically insert sort works fast if the input is close to sorted. That, that is a property that can be tested. So whether, whether a certain input is close to sort, it can be tested very efficiently. So that means that you can design a timer for insert sort. So those are some examples. Um, so beyond property testing and sorting, just as another example, this is not a complete timer. Uh, this is almost, again, these are all just puzzles at the moment. There, there is need to develop this kind of theory for more real, real um, problems. But uh, so Euclid's GCD algorithm on n-bit numbers. Right? So this, everyone remembers this algorithm. You take two numbers, A and B. You divide the smaller number into the larger number and replace the larger number by the remainder until you get a zero, and then you stop. So this is the Euclid's algorithm. right? Um, so um, we know that on n-bit numbers, Euclid's algorithm runs in order n time. This is a very nice analysis that uh, runs in order n time. But what if we have a deadline function that is a k which is less than n? How can you tell, given two inputs, whether um, Euclid's algorithm will finish in less than k iterations, where k is some smaller number. And this is not a complete timer, but uh, so this is an error. This is actually if. It's not only if. So, uh, so oh, no, no, this is correct. In this way, it's correct. So maybe I'll say it like this. If x and y are of this form, then we can, we can prove that Euclid's algorithm takes at least k iterations. So it is correct the way it's written. This is the con the, con the contrapositive that's written there. Is so Fibonacci these are Fibonacci. I'm sorry. These are Fibonacci numbers, and it's not hard to see why. I mean, it's fairly trivial to see why because whenever we divide y is a smaller number here, if you divide x by y, you're going to get a quotient of one, and when you subtract out uh, y, therefore you take x minus y, and you'll get f k minus three c plus f k minus four d. And the thing will propagate until you get you know, k rounds of these things. So at least for pairs which are of this form, we can be sure that we're going to take at least k steps. So we could, we could solve this, this pair of simultaneous equations for c and d. Um, and and if, if you get a solution, then you know you should stop, you should stop this algorithm, because um, it's going to take too long, given the deadline function. So that's an example of a, of a non-trivial timer. Um, so it doesn't always stop inputs uh, where it takes long. Yeah. Just a general question, not specifically on this. Mm -hmm. So you have a deadline k, and you're spending some of that time. <laughs> the you're anticipating my second. Uh, <laughs> that's that's a great segue, and I think I'm just about ready to move on. But yes, yeah. That oh, I'm not going to mix the two. But you're asking me to sort of take what I'm going to say next and put it into this context. Okay. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't know how to do what you want, actually, in this case. Yeah. OK. Um, so uh, some other problems with timers. Um, um, so some iterative algorithms, for example, finding fixed points. Uh, you, can, you can sometimes get a bound on the number of iterations, a lower bound on the number of iterations, based on the derivative of the function for which you're finding the fixed point or something like that. Or some other you know, numerical analysis algorithms, you have some lower bounds for convergence. And so you could design timers by quickly analyzing these lower bound conditions. Um, enumeration algorithms, where the goal is to enumerate so all the maximum matchings in a graph or something like that, you can get a timer by you know, counting or approximately counting the objects you want to enumerate, and that will tell you at least how long you will take. Um, and there's also, you can prove, I mean, you can get timers for problems that are in RP and just co RP if one of the sides is much faster than the other. Uh, so I won't say much about that. Um, 
OK, so now I'll get to the second part of the talk. And so that, that's the thing about timers. The second part is uh, really, again, the title of the talk as well. This is work done by my, my student at that time, Andy, Andrew McGregor. Uh, but it's very relevant. To, it's very similar to this timers model as well. OK, so slightly different highway situation. Because everybody was talking about traffic, I was trying to find um, tra examples from traffic to motivate my talk. Uh, so slightly different highway situation. You've sort of, you're going for a job interview. You've got 45 minutes to get there. But you've cut things close, and you don't quite know how to go. You could spend a little bit of time you know, trying to find, you know, this is Waze, for example. You can go to Waze and spend some time trying to figure out the route. And you may not be happy with the route. And you may spend a little more time going to Google Maps to find another route. And so you could spend a, fair, a bit of time computing. But that eats into the time you have to get there. Okay, So this is a static. It's the, the previous motivating example I gave was a more dynamic thing. You're on the freeway. And you've got to have a deadline. You've got to decide what to do. This is like you have time to do something. but the time you spend planning gives you less time to execute the plan. That, that, that's what it means to say when computing time is time lost. OK, so, um, so, so and then I guess you have to choose how many different maps you're going to go to and so on. So I'll give you one concrete example. Um, so, so a scheduling problem. Um, so the, the problem is you're given an instance with n jobs uh, and need to schedule on one processor. Um, and the difference he here is that the time to schedule is part of the time you have. So you have a total time t. At time 0, you're told what the end jobs are, yeah, various parameters of the end jobs. You've got to decide what, to do, what the schedule is, and then execute the schedule on this processor. Okay, so, um, and so what is the characteristic of each job? Each job has a release time, ri, the ith job. It has a length, li. and there's a value for performing the job. That's the amount of payoff you get for performing the job. Um, and you can only perform a job after its release. Okay, so, um, so now what if the time to compute is part of the time t? And we want to compare our solutions in this model to the static version where you, offline version, where you could plan your schedule beforehand and use all of the time t to execute the schedule. So we want to compare what we can do in this kind of model versus the best you can do if you had time beforehand to prepare for the schedule. And of course, in order to have a chance at all, you cannot let a job be very long. Suppose the highest value job is a job that takes exactly t steps. Okay? And then every other job is minuscule and gives you very little payoff. If you do any time planning, then you're going to not be able to perform that high value job, whereas the offline schedule is going to perform the high value job and you're hopelessly lost. Right? So to avoid that, let's assume that no job is, um, is got, you know, takes more than t over k for some k greater than 1. So maybe some real k greater than 1. Okay, and the k will show up in various bounds, so you should remember what that k is. It's a bound on the length of the largest job. Um, so there's a standard dynamic programming version, which is pseudo-polynomial for this problem. Um, the pseudo-polynomial version is to say the optimal schedule um, that schedules all jobs from i to n. What happened to my slide? Oh, I, I lost all the text. OK, one second. Maybe I should just advance that. OK, so pseudo sorry. So the pseudo-polynomial algorithm uh, so uses the recurrence below. Sort jobs in increasing order of release time. Um, and then uh, let, so, so we're letting this dit be the best reward from jobs i through n in the last t seconds. So it's a standard. And then you can compute a recurrence for dit as uh, the maximum over, I mean, so it's, it's just simple standard recurrence. But just it's a, it's a maximum of two different terms, whether you use job i or not. Okay, so that's all to remember. Uh, so each dit can be computed with a max of two things. Um, and then, let's see. So again, eating, computing the recurrence eats into the time t available for scheduling. That's the, that's the model we have. And just to make the, so if one of these times is much smaller than the other, if the scales are very different, this problem is not that interesting. That is, if the compute time to compute the schedule is super fast and the schedule execution is very long or vice versa, then of course, it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you can just do what you would have done. So you've got to have them be roughly about the same amount of time. And so in order to achieve that, let's say that uh, computing one step of the recurrence, one value in the recurrence takes some tau over n time. 
Okay, so that computing um, every dit for one value of t, you fix the value of t, computing all n dit's takes tau time. So that's the constant amount of time it takes to compute one value of t. And, and let's say that tau is less than one, just, um, uh, yeah. To compute the, the optimal schedule for t2 seconds, you need tau of t2 time, okay? So um, that's the model. Um, okay, this happened again and again. Okay, let's see. I just put it all in. Oops, okay. Um, so you're going to compute for um, t1, uh, which is tau t over 1 plus tau time, and run for t, uh, t2, which is t over 1 plus tau time. So basically, however long you're going to run the schedule, you need tau times that time to find the schedule for that length of time. So if you solve this out, you find that the, uh, the, the best thing to do if you're going to do, use dynamic programming all the way, is to use um, this much compute time and this much um, ske actual schedule running time. And you can prove that that achieves a profit, again, compared to the offline version, it achieves a profit of that much. Okay, so this is like saying that you're going to you're set on doing dynamic programming, you're just finding the optimal schedule for as long as you can, and then running the dynamic programming for um, the, length, the rest of the time. So for example, if tau is a half, what you're going to say is that I'm going to spend time computing for t over 3 of the time, and run the dynamic programming for 2t over 3 of the time. That's what tau equals a half would tell you. But, but maybe that's not the best thing to do. Um, and uh, so, wow, well, this again. Okay, so that may not be the best thing to do. And one thing that actually beats that bound is the following algorithm. Don't run dynamic programming all the way, but use it only up to the point where the time that you've computed for and the time that you've scheduled for together add up to something less than t. So you give yourself a little bit of room and do one job greedily in that little bit of room that you've left yourself. And the greedy part takes tau time to compute, uh, and then you have still t over k time to do that one job, and that's enough for any job. So, so basically, you, you stop short with the dynamic program. You don't actually schedule the whole interval, and then leave yourself room to do one job greedily. And you can prove that actually achieves a better ratio. So that's, that ratio is better than the previous ratio, and if you look at the details, you'll see exactly in the, in the lower parameters. But, I mean, that's just a, a proof of concept that, in fact, you, there's something to be done here. It's a kind of a meta-algorithm that's mixing the right amount of dynamic programming with the right amount of greedy, and this is one particular mix that does slightly better, um, but maybe there are other mixes. So could we do even better with a different mix of greedy and DP? I don't know. Um, so this is, again, just the first example in this area. There are probably other problems to consider as well feels extremely true to life, that you do careful planning, but it's too much hassle to plan all the way to the end. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but again, it, maybe it's the more sophisticated thing to do. I don't know at what point we give up and just do something crazy, but maybe you should do it earlier. Yeah. So uh, what's the cost model for counting how long it takes to compute the schedule? So. The other the tasks, you have a fixed, you're told how long they take. Right. The, 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 so the, we said that uh, I made the primitive how long it takes to solve one step of the recurrence. And I said that takes about tau over n steps for some constant tau. So that n recurrence va recursive values together can be computed in tau time. So just, just as a way of getting the scales to balance. Uh, tau is this thing that allows you to, uh, to scale it to Exactly. So yeah. So basically, right. You can figure out the correct, the optimal schedule for one more time instant in time tau more steps, and tau maybe a half or something less than one. Yeah. Um, okay. So actually, when I talked to Dick about this, he said, uh, "What about branch and bounds?" So I thought about it. I, I, I have. I mean, I don't have any result here, but um, so another sort of problem we could consider is a kind of a branch and bound setting, where. Um, Let's say that each node in a branch and bound tree takes a constant time to evaluate. Um, so at, at each node, you get lower and upper bounds on the best solution and some way of capturing the uncertainty about the actual solution possible in the subtree rooted there. Uh, and descendants have less uncertainty than ancestors. Uh, as you go down the tree, you're more and more sure about the exact time your solution uh, will take. So you're, you're, you're finding a schedule. So the optimum solution is a schedule which fits in the remaining after the branch and bound is done. 
And so we need to find the correct solution, and we don't know anything about how to do this. OK, so that basically is all. I had a half hour slot in the afternoon, so I, I planned for half an hour. Uh, so I guess I'm a little early now. Uh, yeah. It's all stuff. Reminds me a little bit of one of the things uh, Amin talked about yesterday. I think it was a setting where you had a distribution over uh, arrivals in some sense, and you spent like an epsilon amount of time uh -huh. learning or estimating the distribution. Right, yeah, yeah. Is there other frameworks like he was talking about? Which... Yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, he was talking about the online matching problem with that kind of, uh, you spend a little bit of time. Right, uh, yeah, looking at the distribution of the boys that are going to arrive and then plan your matching accordingly. That, that's the setting. Um, so here... Do you think this could be relevant for online algorithms? I think so. I mean, this is definitely a case of, But then, okay, so what is the computing time here? So while you're watching the initial sample, maybe you're, you're computing the distribution. So, okay, so I don't know if it fits directly because I want all the input to arrive at time zero. That's, the model is you have all the input arriving at time zero, you spend a little bit of time computing, and then you have to execute what you have. So the online version doesn't seem to fit that well. In setting, you're really getting the data as time goes by. That's right, yeah. yeah. I mean, I yeah. guess maybe one connection would be there's this notion of epsilon greedy in learning algorithms where you spend uh -huh. some, which is exactly what Amin was doing. Yeah. Um, and there's sort of refinements of this where you say that instead of spending time to learn and then executing a fixed algorithm, you sort of yeah. learn dynamically as you go. So maybe there are variants here where instead of spending the time initially, you can I see. Yeah, no. yeah, then you have to go to a model where inputs are coming all the time. But right now I'm thinking of the model with inputs all arriving at the beginning, but maybe there are interesting versions of this problem where inputs keep arriving. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot to be done here. Yeah. There's a related flavor of work uh, a student at MIT recently where you use this additional computing time to decrease the variance or you know, to learn some distributional information about the, the running time of the job. Uh -huh. So it's a trade-off between using time for sort of being able to schedule better, which is, I mean, it's a different flavor, but, but That's it has interesting. sort of trade-off kinds of properties. Yeah. It is a little bit like the first part of the second part, like in the first part of the second part. Like you have a deadline and you, want, you spend some time figuring out if you'll make the deadline and then run it, like what you were asking earlier. Yeah. Another example might be the multi arm bandit problem, uh -huh. where you're, uh, let's say, uh, playing slot machines, then you're trying to find the slot machine that gives you the best payoff per step. Um, but you need to, or maybe choosing medical treatments. Okay. Yeah. 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 Something like that. And at some point, you have to uh, decide that you've done enough sampling and you're just going to stick with one right. treatment that appears to be the best. And then yeah. stick with it. Adaptively, you might say that if the sampling is a very close race between two treatments, then you can predict that you, it wouldn't be it would be pointless to do more sampling. You might as well cut it short and go with one of them. I see. It's a little bit also like the sector tree problem, like the stopping rule kinds of things, right? I mean, isn't that uh, of the same flavor? Yeah, yeah. So maybe following this comment, uh, mm -hmm. what happens if you? Uh, have to play this game repeatedly, uh -huh. uh, and and you know you don't you don't need to succeed every single time, but um, mm -hmm. you want most of the time to do it to to, to fall within your uh, time limits. Right. But wait, so you're saying, but in both cases, are you saying that the the effect of the bandit is to give you a length of require a length of time, or is it a quality of treatment or something like that? That's more. Yeah, treatment, but if, <coughs> if yeah. you find that two treatments are uh, mm -hmm. indistinguishable in their performances so far, yeah. you might conclude that the time of, uh, but the cost of distinguishing them will be so great that you might as well right. stop and just take one. Yeah, yeah, that is uh, right, okay. And, and that's right. So I think that is an interesting direction to explore. Right? Yeah. Um, I think it, so. Here it's not like t trading off computing time, but the cost of computing against the cost, the benefit you could derive from a slightly better treatment. So that's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you discover that one mapping application 
almost always is better than the other. Maybe you should stop. That's okay. It. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. Each time you just know that. <laughs> but you know that that's not going to be the case, right? I mean, it's, there are certain areas of the world and certain geographies where one mapping thing is going to be better than the other. That's what everyone says. But uh, uh, yeah, it, yeah. It sounds like we're talking about reinforcement learning now. We'll, yeah. We have a Bunch of heuristics. Right. We don't know which is good, and we slap them into form a basis for Q learning or T learning, and then we update yeah. our decisions. And then there's a stopping rule we're talking about of when right. if it's good enough, we don't need to update. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there you can formalize it all. There's a Bellman error, which right. is your checker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's somehow there's a feeling that there the exploration time is exogenous. I mean, you, you could have many people explore, and here it's like. When you spend time exploring, you're losing the time to do what you have to. It's a, it's a bit more endogenous the but time, still, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's still there, though. Even yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, it depends yeah. on the application. But yeah. yeah. Sometimes you have the same problem with. Uh, yeah. Time. Yeah. Yeah. There's also the variant where there's some parallelism, right? So you have a high-level planner and a low-level executor. Uh -huh. And you still, uh, I mean, if you're taking more time to plan, you may still delay the start time of your of the task, right? Right, right, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. That would be an interesting thing to look at, especially, I think, in areas like control, you often Yeah, especially if you replace release times with deadlines. So say, say you have deadlines for tasks to, in order to, to get the reward that you're going to get, which is a common scheduling variant, then any time you spend planning, you're not going to meet some deadlines. You're going to miss some jobs deadlines and so on. So uh, there, there might be, the, the difference there is that you might actually do the planning a little later. You might do something quickly now, and then, I don't know, so it's a little bit more complicated. You might mix in the scheduling with the planning because you need to meet deadlines. So th that's a different variant. So you yeah. want to maximize maybe the throughput of times you succeed. Throughput, but I mean, ultimately you want to get the maximum reward from the jobs you meet the deadlines for or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we wait till 10.15 because they may be late okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So short break now and then yeah. we break. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs>